Hello, beautiful people. My guest today is Hector Rodriguez. Hector is an absolute beast. He is an ultra marathon runner. He's a husband. He's a father. And in this conversation, we went deep on his transformation. How did he go from someone who was sitting on the couch to somebody who now, most recently, ran over 200 miles in, I want to say, a a hundred hour time span, like something crazy like that. So Hector's an absolute legend. And I really love these stories of people who were inspired by people like David Goggins or Kobe Bryant. And they go on to do things that transform themselves and impact their, their communities, their families, and everything in between, and most importantly, themselves. So if you enjoyed this episode with Hector Rodriguez, please share it with a friend. I hope the background noise gets edited out in post-production, but if not, I apologize for that. And also, I'd love your thoughts about this episode at Hey Danny Miranda on Twitter or Instagram. Thank you, as always, for listening. I appreciate you from the bottom of my heart. And let's get into this episode with Hector Rodriguez. Interesting people, thought-provoking conversations, nutrition for your brain. Journey through the minds of the world's top performers and discover what it really takes to achieve your highest version. This is the Danny Miranda Podcast. Hector, thank you for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate you taking the time. Excited to dive into your story and who you are because so much of who you are and what you've done is so near and dear to my heart. And so I'm, when you accomplish and when I research your story, I'm like, wow, that is a like mind and a like individual. And for that, I'm grateful. So really excited to dive into it today. Awesome, man. I'm excited to chat with you today too. So why don't we start off with Kobe Bryant? I know you wear his bib on your, your bibs are representative of him why Kobe Bryant and why did he make such a profound impact on your life yeah when I um my my toughest challenge to date was doing the Moab 240 and when I decided to go for that back in October of last year um my my bib was 224 which was for Kobe and his daughter and I have just so much love for Kobe Bryant and what he displayed obviously on the court you know as an athlete but I really fell in love with you know what he showed after that really touched me Um, he was a girl dad I'm a girl dad I have two little girls and what really struck for me was I listened to a podcast with him and Lewis Howes and I might have some of this off but essentially what he was telling Lewis was that after basketball, he was, you know, still working really hard, but he was leaving the house and going to the office. And, you know, he was doing all of the stuff with the film studio and and all kinds of, you know, other work. And he was working his butt off, probably the same or, or if not more than he was when he was training in the NBA. But what he realized was that his daughters weren't able to see him work and so he was like, man, like, I want to I wanna do something about that. So what he did was he started waking up at 4 a.m. and hitting drills and working out in the gym at the house. And then he started inviting his daughter with him to come and have some daddy-daughter time. Um, and then they started working, obviously hard. Uh, and he was able to show his daughter discipline, relentlessness, grittiness, Things take time, you know, the fundamentals, hard work, just the effort things take. And so he really was able to show through training these life lessons that can just apply to anything in life. And for whatever reason, at that moment, it just, a light bulb went off in my head and I was like, hell yeah, like we can use our training as a tool to teach our kids. So like I follow Sue, I'm not an NBA player, but... I'm an endurance athlete. I love being on the trails. I love being in the mountains. And through the miles I've put down these past three years and through these crazy challenges I've done, I've absolutely shown my daughters 
firsthand, right in front of their face, discipline, hard work, things take time, grittiness, relentlessness, like just what the mental mindset, like the right mindset, how far you can go. Um, there's been countless times where they've come into the garage and they see me just just full of sweat. You know, they're just seeing my effort. You know, so many times they wake up and I'm already gone. Like I'm already 10 miles into a run, you know, and when I'm coming, finishing the run, they're seeing that. So my girls are very young, uh, but my goal is just that every single one of these workouts, you know, 0.01% just sticks in their head and it just keeps sticking, sticking, sticking. So when they're adults and they have their passion, they're going to know the work ethic it requires to have success in whatever they want to have success in. And they're going to know that their dad was the hardest worker they ever seen. And uh, my goal is that they pay that forward to their kids. That's a beautiful, beautiful mission. And I want to go back to a time in your life maybe when you didn't have this mindset. Because it's easy to hear someone talk about how you're talking. And for someone maybe on the couch right now to be thinking, that doesn't sound like me. I wish that was me. But it's not. So could you take us to a time in your own life when you weren't embodying this mindset and this, this ability to inspire and, and just the work ethic it, it took? Yeah, I like, man, it's, it's, I'm 38 years old, probably 35. Uh, 35 years of my life was the, probably the complete opposite. You wow. know, when I reflect on my life, um, I think I came from a generation that – you know, like probably like a 15, 16 years old, man. Like we would just, I'm from South Cal, I'm from San Diego. And what we did was like, we would go to school and then after school we would get like, you know, the group together and we would be drinking beers in people's backyards and having little high school parties. And then that turned into, you know, being 21 and I lived in downtown San Diego, which is like so much nightlife there. And just me and the people I was around thought that our lives were work, you know, our jobs Monday through Friday and then on the weekends go get <laughs> go get trashed on the weekends and and that's our life, go chase the girls around, you know, the clubs and the bars and thankfully, like, I snapped out of that and realized that's not where the money's at, like, that's not where success lies, like, that's easy it's so easy to just go to a bar on a Friday night and you know, drink a few beers and get hammered. Like the hard thing is waking up at four or five in the morning on Saturday to go crush a workout. So I just felt like the generation and the people I was around was just so accustomed to that. And I just, and then I had a job where I was traveling a lot and I would be in these hotels and it's just so easy again. Like what was the easy path? The easy path was like, all right, go down to the, lobby eat burger eat fries and have you know an ipa or have you know you know just a a couple of beers and then call it a night and wake up go to the next day and go to work and just kind of be in this routine of just comfort and i'm just like i have found that comfort is like it's truly a slow death like um i detest comfort now like i it just makes me like itchy if I'm not like moving and and being active you know um so I I think thankfully I found in the past three years um what wakes me up inside and what lights me up and uh it was the opposite of what I was doing for so long um so I'm just blessed I found it and I walk around just so happy and ecstatic for life bro it's it's awesome Let's get to what woke you up. What was the moment, if one, that just said to yourself, oh, wow, this is a new world, and I want to live in this world? Yeah, I think, I think maybe, maybe there's like four, um, let's, three or let's four. Let's go through them. Yeah. So the first was, I believe it was 2018, August. August 2018, my brother... Um, had signed up for his uh, for a 50 mile trail race in Big Bear, California, which is this awesome town, out you know big trees, like just beautiful. 
And I had never really been out like in nature like that. I was, like I told you, I was living in downtown San Diego. I was living much, very much a city boy. Um, and so I went, I was like, yeah, I'm going to come out and I'm going to, I'm going to support you, come out, cheer you on. So around mile 35, 36, 37, um, I forget, but I seen him coming by and he looked just defeated, destroyed, uh, just bad. He was in bad shape and I had never seen him like that. And so I was like, oh man, this course is kicking his butt. So I don't even know if I went against the rules of the race or what, but I was like, yo, I'm going to jump on the course with you and I'm going to pace you. Come on, man, let's go. We got this. We'll do this as a team. And we went like a mile up and he was huffing, he was puffing, the altitude, you know, the uh, amount of effort he exerted, he was just done. And he was like, man, I can't do it no more. So in that mile stretch, I'm looking around and just like a shift happened in me, man. Like I was just like, man, nature is fire. This is legit. Like this is so beautiful. I feel so connected. My brother's back here dying, you know, and he's given his full effort, but like, this is awesome. So like, we ended up DNF in that race, unfortunately, and what stuck with me was, hey, he went and tried something so hard that he pushed so hard that he couldn't finish. That was one. So I was like, I want to see what that's like. And then two, I want to connect. Uh, I want to get in nature more. Like, this was really awesome. So that kind of stuck in my brain. Then in December of 2018, I was away from work, and out of nowhere for me, my wife had a really bad anxiety attack that she had to go to the doctor and she kind of even till to this day still sometimes suffers like from a PTSD of that attack and she was really worried after um, that happened of her mental mindset and I was seeing her be fearful that if she could be as strong as she needed to be for herself and for my two little girls. So just knowing the lifestyle I was living, you know, this kind of flying back and forth, drinking beers, sometimes I'd run, sometimes I wouldn't. Uh, I was heavier than I've ever been in in this time frame. And that was kind of a wake-up call for all of us. I had also, like, took a step back, and I was thinking about what I was seeing some of my siblings doing my parents, other people around me, and it just felt like everybody was medicating themselves in unhealthy ways, and I'm the oldest, um, the oldest kid, so I was like, you know what, I need to lead by example of this medicating in these unhealthy ways is not the way to go. So thankfully, at the same time, David Goggins, Joe Rogan, you know, podcast hits and the book hits. And I see, I read through that book, I I listen, I catch up like on all of the Dave Goggins podcasts that I can. And just something just, just inside me just lights up. And I'm like, man, like I relate so much to this. So then I'm now on a mission where I'm like, I'm getting after it every day. I'm hitting, I set a 10 mile a day goal. Uh, to average 10 miles a day every day and I'm still on it three years later of of just putting down miles and realizing how much that impacts not only just the benefits of like the physical working out but just my mental mindset is just has hit like another level and I and I believe it started from that foundation of just doing things you don't want to do doing things that suck and just hitting that pavement every single day just build so much confidence and build so much grit and determination and rebaselines what's hard. So like I had that going and then I had signed up for this 24 hour race at some point. And this would be like kind of the last like awakening for me. And I had one of my best friends who was going to come pace me at the night of this 24 hour race. It was basically a, a two mile course. Like you do loops and you see how many miles you can do in 24 hours. Well, about 30, 32 miles in, he texts me. He goes, yo, how's it going? You know, like, I'm going to be there, I think he said, like, 11 o'clock that night. And I was like, awesome, but I don't know, man. Like, my knees are really hurting. I'm in a lot of pain, and, like, I might be done. And right when I I text him back, um, like, kind of giving them a heads up on my knee, I was like, man, you know what? Forget this, man. Like, I'm not going down right now. 
And I was like, I'm going to go another mile. Like, I have to go another mile. And I think nine times out of ten, the old me would have just been like, ah, that's, that's it. Like, I'm done. I'll, I'll try another day. But this time, I was like, nah, F that. Like, I'm pushing. And I ended up going 58 more miles um, past that point and ended up getting, like, a top five finish in that race. And that's where, like, I'll go back to Goggins, like, that 40% rule. And I said, damn, like... I just went 58 more miles when I thought I was done at mile 32. What else have I been living on the table? Like, what is my limit? And it really just just ripped off limitations for me. And I said, like, what else am I capable of? And I've been down a nasty rabbit hole trying to find what my limits are. And I've yet to hit it. And I've done some gnarly stuff. So, like, I've seen firsthand, like, we, me, you, you know, everybody listening we're capable of so much more than we ever thought possible and i can speak from that firsthand dude that is crazy okay so you're on mile 32 (laughs) and yeah and you you want to quit you hear your voice the real voice in your head saying you're going to quit and like the pain And my knees hurting your knees hurting you're done go to the couch just relax go to another day come back what what actually pushes you to go one more and then like at what point did you find your second win it just i just i didn't want i didn't want to give in you know and it just it's i don't know if it was my body lying to me or just my mind freaking out and just saying go seek comfort but like a mile later that knee pain went away and it never came back and so i don't know what to make of that but then i was able to get going you know obviously pain comes from being on your feet, moving, you know, this, this was like a mountain town. So there was pain, but there was never a pain. Like, I'm a believer you push through pain, but you don't push through injury. And so the knee for a second had me thinking I was pushing through injury, but I, when I said, nah, I'm going to keep going, then all of a sudden it just, like, stopped, and then it just became pain that I knew I could push through, and I did. How do you identify that point? I'm just starting my running journey right now. Yeah. And- my, my mission is to run a marathon in 12 weeks, right? I've never run more than eight miles, which I did on Sunday. So I'll real, you, real newbie to the game. Thank you. Yeah. What, what am I, what's the difference between pain and injury? Man, I think that's, it's like, it's why I can't like preach to do what I do because I think it's such a fine line. Um, and I would hate for somebody to hurt themselves. Um, all I can say is like, I think once you start putting in enough miles and you just start really getting aware of how you're feeling, uh, that I just think, at least for me, like something comes to where you know when you're pushing pain and when you're pushing injury and when you can go and when you need to back off. So all I could advise is just really pay attention to what your body's telling you and push through that pain like i'm going to encourage the heck out of you push through pain but if you feel an injury's coming then i would say absolutely save it for another day it seems like you've cultivated a deep awareness of what your body is feeling in any given moment and that comes from putting the miles in yes i agree 100 percent with that like i can notice everything when i um, i'm such in a flow state and such in a mode when I'm running that like to this day like I have to have like a certain run shirt I have to have certain run shorts this is brand reigning champ that I love like I feel really off if I don't have like that material because I'm just so used to it like the socks you know like the the run shoes when I switch it like there definitely comes a point to where like all of those little things like just feel natural and something doesn't feel natural you immediately know really quick how much of that of needing the specifics of each piece of clothing and the shoe to be to your liking how much of that is seeking comfort and when do you know okay i need a different shirt because i'm getting too comfortable in this one even though i'm running absurd amount of miles is that a thing you're worried about or or not at all no like so like for me like like I just this past weekend or just last week I ran 209 miles 
in uh, the Cascade Mountains with like 46,000 feet of climbing of elevation. So like I knew it was going to be hell. I knew I was going to be in a battle. I knew it was going to be a war. Uh, it was going to be just nasty. So if I could at least have like my shirt comfortable, my shorts comfortable, the right shoes, the right warmth for the nights, you know, the right layers off for the days. Like I wanted to give myself the best chance to fight those mountains. So uh, for me, finding the right gear to go, it's like it's like my shield and sword. So I had I have my perfect seal shield and sword to go into that arena to fight. And for me, uh, a lot of it is my gear and my run shoes and my pack. Like I just got to be set for war and uh and thankfully i went into the arena this this past week and i won that's beautiful man do you have any specific mental talk or things you lean on mentally when the going gets incredibly incredibly tough are, are there things that pop to your mind that you just go to instinctively like mantras or just like things i think about or or both yeah. or yeah. uh definitely a mantra uh Two of them that I have um, come from Chad Wright, who is a Navy SEAL ultra runner. And the two that, that really stand out for me is be hard when it gets hard. Because absolutely any ultra you, you're going to do, even your marathon, there's going to come a point where you're going to have to be hard when it gets hard. If not, you're going you're gonna to quit. You're going to stop. And then the second is don't die in the chair. So, like, I don't want to... You know, for me, you know, although it may happen one day, but like I don't want to DNF on that chair. Like, I want to keep moving. If I miss a cutoff, like I'm gonna go until as long as I can go. Um, and if I gotta die in battle, then I'll die in battle, which is better than in the chair for me. So, uh, I like really like those two mantras. And then other things I'm thinking about is man, like I'm this hat you see it says wolf pack, which is another word for like love, community, tribe. Um, it's just a, it's a, it's a team of amazing people that have shown me immense love. Um, so I'll think about them a lot and I'll think about the kind words and the fuel they've provided me. And, you know, in return, I try to make them proud. I try to be a leader by example. And so, you know, I have that that I think about to to help propel me forward and then obviously my wife and my daughters and my family um, you know I, I I think I've in the last three years I've probably hit 11 12,000 miles and I'm, so now that I'm at this peak of of my three hardest challenges which is uh, this triple crown of 200s I want to show that hard work works and I'm going to give my all to prove that uh, as I know that my daughters are here in these races and uh, again like I want that 0.001% to stick um, so me just showing that for my family and for the community uh, has been absolute fuel for me you know something that's very uncommon in today's day and age is to feel a sense of community a feel a sense of tribe to other people it's a beautiful thing that endurance sports seem to bring about in terms of communities, in terms of helping people come together because there's such shared pain. And when there's such mm -hmm. shared pain, there's also such shared togetherness, bring together of, mm -hmm. of people. How has the wolf pack, well, how did you get into it to start? And then how has that transformed your life? Oh man, it's been by far the best most beautiful thing I've experienced in like three years. Uh, wow. It makes me emotional just thinking about it, man. Um, <clears throat> what's awesome about it was, was uh, you know, if I recall the dates correctly, it was like March 2020. Um, the pandemic came out of nowhere, right, and, and hit hard. And we were all, at least in San Diego, I can't speak to everywhere in the country, but I think all of us collectively were scared um, were isolated because, you know, they were they're telling you like six feet and, you know, all this stuff. And, and they basically shut down everything for the first time, like in our lifetime, had we ever experienced that. 
shut down the gyms. In San Diego, at some point, they shut down the trails and they shut down the beaches. So on social media, we were like, okay, like they're shutting this, they're shutting this down. Like we don't know, you know, we don't want COVID. Like what do we do? So all of these people that um, came about, uh, you know, came together. So I was like, all right, let's let's do fifty push up, fifty push up challenge, and then we would tag each other. Wolfpack fifty, you know, push up challenge. Hey, let's do planks. Let's run ridiculous miles. Let's go bike. And so this community just started tagging. And so we were like, yeah, like uh, all of the stuff in the city's closed, but working hard, chopping wood, getting after it is not. And so this community was like, we're going to still be better. We're still going to work out. We're going to still make sure our mindset's right. And we're going to still get after it. And we're going to do it while loving, supporting, and encouraging the next person. And so it came from that. So like in the worst time of my life history, which would be like that start of that pandemic where people are freaked out, people are feeling alone, scared, this was born. And since then, it's just grown to where, like, I just ran this race um, called Bigfoot 200 last week that I just mentioned. And I'm going to aid stations, and people are rocking Wolfpack shirts. And it just goes to show, like, how big this community is of people that just love, encourage, and support one another to just be better than they were yesterday. And for that, like, I wouldn't trade that for the world. I'd give back, like, these race medals and buckles. Like, the community is what is just the most beautiful thing in this world. How much going into the quarantine did your previous training help you get through that? Who would you have been if if the quarantine happened in 2017 versus 2020? What would have happened? Oh man, I think I would have been drinking beer. I probably would have gained the most weight I would have ever had. I'd probably be complaining. I'd probably just been miserable man like uh i can't even think i I think i'd I'd probably just probably be picking out food drinking beer watching netflix every day you know where this year where when it happened this year man me and, and the pack like we went so hard in in everything like we were running crazy miles we were people were doing stuff in crossfit cycling swimming uh push ups planks like it was incredible like we got stronger so, yeah, I can't even imagine what 2017 HRO 619 would have been like. It would have been not pretty, for sure. What – was this just a San Diego thing, or was this in the country or world? Like, how, how far did yeah, the Wolfpack go, and how did you stumble across it? Uh, I don't remember where the name actually came, Wolfpack, if I came up with that or somebody came up with that, but we just started shouting Wolfpack out to one another. And uh, I have a buddy, Jem, in Australia who was rocking with us early. There's this this whole military crew out in Japan that were there at the beginning that were on base um, working hard. And then just throughout the country, there was just so so many people that – showed love and got behind and supported what we were doing um and so now it's it's there's pack fam and uk and more just more everywhere man it's really beautiful it's just so beautiful it's it's an incredible thing have you run any races or done anything with members of the wolf pack yeah hell yeah we've uh every race i go to now there's basically wolf pack fam um, I had people that I would call Wolfpack fam run the Bigfoot 200. I got some more that are running Tahoe 200. There's like 10, at least 10 runners that I can think of at Moab 240, which will happen in October this year. Um, we've collectively, uh, earlier this year, we all went out to Arizona, like 10 of us, and did a 50K um, to support uh, one of my friends, Natalie Eva Marie, in her first ultra attempt. So, like, that's an, another example. Like, we'll go out there and just support somebody on their first uh, ultra attempt. Um, so it's it's just it's the most beautiful community, man. I can't get tired of saying that. Something that I've noticed about you is you're really good at cultivating different sources of wisdom from people. I saw that, you know, David Goggins obviously inspired you to begin with. 
but I saw on your Instagram you have quotes from Tim Ferriss and Naval and different people who might not even be considered anything to do with the ultra community, but you've managed to find their wisdom and, and make it your own in a way where you can use it. So how do you go about finding the best people to learn from? Uh, I mean, I have, you know, there's a lot of negative, uh, you hear a lot of negative stuff about social media. Um, and I can totally see why. Um, but for me, it's probably been the complete opposite in the sense that like when I go through my feed, I'm just so inspired by everybody I see. Like I really did a good job of like scrubbing my Instagram at one point and just having it be just people that just inspire me and motivate me. And, uh, and in return, hopefully like I do some of that back and, there's certain accounts um, like our friend Behavior Hack, you know, that that um, curate great content um, that kind of helps me find, you know, those gems, you know, from those people that really motivates and inspires me. So I think through social media has helped me find some of these different people who I normally wouldn't find. And then, then take the next level of doing like a deeper dive and trying to understand whatever their message is. Um, and, you know, a beauty in running so many miles by yourself is that I am by myself and I am alone. Um, so it gives me an opportunity. Sometimes I'll listen to music, but then other times I'll listen to, you know, audiobooks or um, just different things to just, like you said, grab inspiration and grab um, different nuggets from different people to kind of make up myself. It's, it's a really important skill. And what happened when you started scrubbing your Instagram? Were there any negative repercussions of, from people around you, friends or family? Why didn't you, why'd you unfollow me? Why did you do that? Because I think a lot of people are worried about, about that type of thing where if they were to unfollow people or scrub people from their account, they're worried about the repercussions. So did you face any of that? And if you did, take us through that. No, I didn't. I didn't face any of that. So maybe they just, you know, didn't tell me anything. But I really just tried to when I did scrub it, like keep it to the people that a that I'm inspired by, and then b that like I engage with and engages back with me. So I think, I think like those were kind of my my, my two filtering mechanisms. I guess you could say. And so maybe if, maybe they knew like, hey, like I don't ever comment or like or, or you know, support or, or show love. Like, I don't know. Like, I don't know what maybe they're thinking, but I didn't get any pushback. But, you know, that was kind of what I looked for when I was like filtering was like, is this, just, is this, am I getting motivated? Am I getting inspired? Like, do I, is this message this person is giving positive? Is it fueling me? Is it good for me? Is it like, do I feel love or, you know, like, or do I feel like, I, I just had a feel, I can't explain it, but like, like a vibe. And if I felt the vibe, they stayed. And if I didn't feel the vibe, then I had to cut it. And I do believe that, you know, it's important, the crowd you keep around, I think it's important the things you're looking at, whether it's Instagram or, or elsewhere. So I definitely am conscientious of that, and I try to keep uh, I try to keep a wolf pack around me. I try to keep solid, good, trustworthy, loving people in person and virtually around me. And so, if I had repercussions, I would have explained myself. Um, you know, basically, kind of saying that like I just I had to do what was right for me. Yeah, I like that a lot. And what? was the reaction from those closest to you your family specifically and your close friends what did they say when you started to change and start to transform yourself man i was i think goggins kind of prepped me for like kind of the pushback i'd get um it's been very interesting very interesting uh and not what i would have expected for sure um but, 
yeah, like there's just, you know, at, at first there was definitely a lot of people, I, I would get made fun of a lot. Like, oh, you know, you're David Goggins reject. Oh, you're... Oh, you're gonna go run. Oh, you're gonna you're gonna not. I bet you're not gonna come out for happy hour because you're gonna go run, huh? Or like, oh, you're leaving early because you're gonna go run in the morning, huh? Ha ha ha! And you know, like a lot of that kind of stuff I faced. Um, a lot of like, you're crazy. That is bad for you. It's so bad for your knees. Um, you're you'll never sustain. You know, like a lot of negative comments from people very close to me. And what was wild to me was some of these comments were like while they're drinking a beer, you know, or while they're just sitting on the couch. And none of them had any experiencing any experience ever running ultras. But yet they're giving me advice on injuries I'm going to face or what, you know, they're just imposing their limits onto me is my is my thought is, is how I just went in one ear and out the other. And and then like. As I got going and I started having success and I started becoming who I became, you know, rather than like I have people who I've met in the last year that feel like brothers and sisters support me like a hundred times in one week than some of these people have like have shown any love or support in the last two years like so many people like I have so many strangers showing so much more love than friends that I grew up with you know so there are some friends that I grew up with that you know are supporting what I'm doing and showing love and how can I help how can what can we do you know like it's incredible it's amazing you're inspiring and then I've had others just like they're watching everything they're all over my stories watching everything but they're for whatever reason they can't come out to say like hey good job or hey i'm proud of you or hey you've inspired me or hey anything like it's, it's just so strange how that kind of happened and and there's even some family members that like i don't see how you can not be proud of somebody who just finished a 200 mile race and not want to just say hey good job on that and i literally have family members who who acted like that didn't happen and, you know, so I don't no know way. if it's like they've, you know, they've, um, like, I, I don't think the mind, the, that kind of get after it every day mentality and that really pushing and really emptying your tank and really just getting after it, it just doesn't sit with everybody is what I've learned. And there's people that are the complete opposite. And I don't know if that's, you know, I don't know if they're happy or not. Like, I, hopefully they are. But I think there's people that just are looking for a very, very comfortable, easy life. And I think I turn them off when they see me doing the things that I do because they want no part of that. And so I have family members that are very comfortable and very relaxed. And I don't think they, for whatever reason, nothing I do resonates with them well. So it's just been an interesting, super interesting um spectrum of love and support from different uh, scenarios or different people I guess that's so fascinating man and how do you take that situation or what advice would you give to someone who is pursuing their highest version and their close family member is saying who cares and that's really difficult for them what advice would you give them don't stop. Keep going. You're on the right path. Um, you can't, you know, you can't not keep moving forward. Like, these people that I mentioned, like, if, when they're ready, like, I'll put my arm back and I'll try to pull them up. Um, I still love them. Um, but we we can't stop. We just got to keep moving forward. Um I, what I just mentioned, like some of the disappointment of the behavior or, or like maybe lack of encouragement or lack of support that I thought some of these people would provide, like, you know, would be like my biggest cheerleaders or most love, most support. You know, like maybe it was this amount of people, but this amount has came since. And now, like, now it's, I, I found wolves. I'll call them wolves. I found like, 
these different packs of wolves that just came in and just show love, show support, and I do it right back. Like, there's no doubt that I'm, I'm not, like, if me and you hang out, like, I'm going to give more than I take every single time. So, like, yeah, like, it sucks some relationships didn't work out, but I have a huge community that I can look towards for love, support, encouragement, guidance, help, assistance, you know, all of these things, like, tenfold. Like, I, I could... I literally now have been able to go into Oregon, go into Arizona, and be like, "Yo, H Rod's in town. Let's let's who wants to hang out?" And I'll have like big groups like come out and run and meet me and hang out. Like, it's it's, it's incredible. So like, it definitely is worth it. And so I would just say, keep moving forward. Hit me up if you got to. I'll support you, dude. That is epic. And tell me about. Now you are building this person and you mentioned before about how you are at one point you hit some level of success and I'm curious what that point was for you and how far along your journey it was. Well, for me, the success was that 24 hour race Mm. that I mentioned Um, because before that I had had what I would call three DNFs uh, on three different like ultra attempts. So that would be like where I started to figure things out where during the race, I was able to start problem solving where I started to see the negative thoughts and how they were impacting me and then started rewiring that and started going like thinking more positively and realizing how important the positive mindset can have in whatever endeavor you're in Um, because then after that 24-hour race I went and did a hundred miler on a treadmill and then I went and did a last person standing race where I went like 146 miles on a treadmill and got second place and then I went and did Moab 240 which that year I think was the hardest race that um, was held and I finished that alongside David Goggins which was awesome um, and then this year I've been just smashing pretty much ultras every month. And then I just did the Bigfoot 200 and I got a Tahoe 200. So, um, I've, I'll knock on wood, but in these long enduring events, I'm now being able to see the problems and I'm being able to proactively work through them. And it's allowing me to finish these races and I haven't had a DNF in so long. So and in these ultra races that are so long, like, there's no guarantee for anybody. Like, you could just have one bad rock twist your ankle, or you could screw up your nutrition, and, and because you're so, um, like, mushy in the brain, <laughs> that you could forget to eat or drink for a couple hours, and that could just destroy your whole race. So now, like, when I say success, is like I'm – being able to problem solve during these races, figure things out, stay positive as much as possible, notice the negative thoughts, the negative mindset, flip that into positivity, and then keep it going. And I've been able to continuously finish all of these ultras and all of these tough, enduring acts that I keep throwing myself into. Could you take us through an example of you actually problem solving with the things that you were saying to yourself or a problem you faced and then actually the solving of that problem? Well, I could give you one that I got help with that was really stood out was uh, I was in I was in a, this Bigfoot 200 race, right? And this is, goes back to just like love and fuel. And I was, I believe I was like on towards the last day. I had one of the last climbs to do. Uh, which, you know, probably was like 40,000 feet I had already done. And it was super steep. I get to the top, and I'm just done. Like, I'm just just spent emotionally, physically. I had been on my feet probably 80-plus hours, slept maybe less than four. And I was just emotional. Like, I was just raw. Those These races make you raw. They, like, rip everything physically and mentally for you. And I'm just sitting there, uh, just just feeling done. 
and I, and I recognize it, and I'm like, I need to like, I need to regroup, I need to like take a couple minutes, <clears throat> get the positivity back, and my pacer gives me a letter, and the letter was basically um, a, a message from my youngest daughter, just saying pr- she's proud of me, um, and like go wolf pack at the end, and I don't want to like say the details because I'll probably start bawling right here, but it was enough in you know in the message that just totally recalled my why and just lit up fire in me because one she's recognizing what I'm doing she's proud of me and then she's realizing you know the community that we're we've created and the importance of it and the beauty of it yeah to give it a shout out in the letter, you know, and I'm just yeah. like, damn, that is so awesome because yeah. I think it's so sad. Um, like I believe, like people have their own beliefs, but I believe we're tribal species and we should be like in crews and teams and we're not meant to go on this journey alone. Uh, and it's like one of my big motivators for like constantly shouting out, like I'm in this interview with you and you can see my hat, like I'm repping it. Uh, you know, and when I went to the finish line, I'm repping it because I want people to not feel alone. I want them to know I got their back and there's a community. And it was beautiful to see my daughter recognize that. So just again, that 0.01% when she's older, she doesn't, I, I want her to not have to feel like she has to do everything alone, that she finds her community and you know gives to the community and then you know when she needs it they're there to support her and her sister my other daughter and together you know they do amazing things because you know we'll we could do so much by ourselves but with a with a crew with people behind you the sky's the limit and so that was really an, an awesome experience yeah it sounds like that moment I, I feel like I'm there with you with the fact reading that letter and at a really difficult point and seeing it my question yeah to you I started is, bawling man I was, yeah. I was really really emotional uh, like as I said because those races just make you so raw like uh, they tore me up but it fueled me too what's the biggest takeaway you've noticed inside your regular life from doing all of these races so to me, to me, that's where I go back to Goggins. Like, I got to credit him. Um, and he'll be the most influential person, I think, ever for me. Because what he did was he showed me how you, kind of like Kobe, too, like you, you take, you go to hell you take yourself to hell in these long enduring challenges right and you put yourself in these situations in those cascade mountains it was hot it took you know i forgot 25 30 runners out the first day the heat then in the night it got cold uh we went through lava fields uh the the we had to climb over trees go under trees uh, the forest was overgrown on the trail, so we had to like literally like go through like all this overgrown vegetation on the trail. Uh, it was forty six thousand feet of climbing. We crossed the rivers. Uh, we went through rain. I mean, like I, I can't even think of what else. Bug bites, mosquitoes. I got stung by a bee. You know, like I literally paid a lot of money to put myself in hell. And more important than just like finishing these races is the training and the person you become in that in the training for these races that's where the money is at like everything that i've done to prepare for these crazy events and then and then everything that's come after enduring it has made me 100 times a better husband better father better for the employer I work better son, better sibling it's like everything it's like when, when, when you put yourself through hell like anybody else's problems like or a long day at work like if I have a 12 hour work day 
it's better than 24 hours of, of constant movement and no sleep. Like, and, you know, like it just re-baselines like what's hard, what's easy. And it just makes me feel like I can handle. It gives me the confidence and the peace that I can outwork 99% of people. If I can outwork them, I can outendure them, I can out endure them, then like I, my family will always have food on the table because I'll go 24, 48, 72, 100 hours just nonstop chopping wood, I call it, to make sure they're okay. And it, you get like confidence from putting yourself in these tough environments and then making it through. So I think that's what Goggins gave me and taught me was like, hey, all of this suffering and all of this difficultness you put yourself through, if shit hits the fan and I need to pivot this energy to getting food for my girls and my wife or to working, you know, 100 straight hours to get this project done, trust me, I absolutely can. And so that's what I find is very powerful. And now I walk around, like, with just peace because I know I have levers that I've trained that I can pull that could just make sure I can endure with the best of them. Something I noticed so common from people who have put themselves through pain is a sense of optimism. And I really feel it from you in that you feel like you can get done whatever you need to get done and you're capable of doing that. Where do you think that stems from? I think it stems from just... It, it stems from... Like I, I said earlier, I've, I've probably done 11,000, 12,000 miles, you know, and I've known, and, and I would say maybe 10,000 of those miles by myself, you know, and so I know what I put myself through. That makes me emotional too. <sighs> um, I've known what I've put myself through. I've known how many times I didn't want to do this shit. But I did it anyway. I know how many times I wasn't feeling my best and I got it done. I know how many times I set that alarm early and got out there. I know how many times at the end of the evening I came home and didn't want to go back out there, but I did. Um, so when you've done, and I know how much time I've spent away uh, from my wife and daughters, to become this person. Um, so when you sacrifice so much, um, it just, you just know that not a lot of people can sacrifice the way you can sacrifice. And if you can sacrifice, endure, you know, and you can keep moving forward despite all of these all of these, maybe all of these obstacles or that voice saying, just go chill. When you know, like, you've done it and you've persevered and you've gotten gritty, you've gotten nasty, you've gotten, you know, fucking into a dogfight and you still come out. It just gives you confidence and peace because you know a lot of people are tapping out way before that. You know, like, I, I truly believe, like, anybody who's doing these 200-mile races and finishing are, like, 1% of... Uh, uh, of the population that can just endure more than anybody. Um, you have to, 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 to move 200 plus miles in these mountains. It's not like it's 200 miles on a flat course. It's up and down mountains. You have to have the mindset of 1% to finish these things. And so just the training on top of being able to complete these things, just, again, like I just know I can pivot the energy if I need to. You've spent so much time alone. What have you learned about yourself? I'm a bad dude, brother. Like, like I don't want to like sound like cocky. You know, like something I'm just, we don't I'm, do enough of. Sorry to cut you <laughs> off. Something we don't do enough of is talk about our strengths because for some reason it's it's looked down upon when we do something good that we shouldn't be able to talk about it. So please. Be cocky. Say what. Say what yeah, is on like your mind. I, the I, truth. I say like I know I'm a hard worker. There's nobody who could take that away from me. There's 
the, again, like the, I just truly believe, and maybe everything I'm saying is placebo. You know, I don't know, but I truly, deep down in my heart, feel I'm one of the hardest workers out here. I'm definitely in that one percent because I know of what I've endured. I know what I'm capable of. I know what I've moved forward through, um, and I'm proud of it. Like. I walk around with peace like nobody, my mom, my dad, my wife, my daughters, like even if they didn't ever tell me they're proud of me, I know I'm proud of me because I know what I've went through. They've never, like just there's no one that knows what I've went through the way I know. So I feel very satisfied and very comfortable that that I've done what I've done and I'm proud of myself. So I just... I. To answer is I just I know I'm a hard worker. Okay, so now I want to take you as a coach, all right? And you are forced to. We're currently 54 minutes into this podcast, which means someone's on minute 54 of their run right now, and I'm curious what advice or what your speech is to someone if you could get in their ear at minute 54 of a long run. What what are you, I know for you fifty four minutes is like just getting started the first the first second of your mm-hmm. your your run but let's say for someone like me who's planning on running a marathon m- minute fifty four is a long time for me to run what are you yeah. saying to me personally keep going baby that's <laughs> it man keep going like um, for me uh, and for what I do. Um, I'm a believer on like just time on feet. Um, I don't always run, um, so I, I do like I, di- I did say like I, I did put down a lot of those miles, but not all of it has been running. Uh, if I'm being honest, a lot of it has been walking, uh, a lot of it has been hiking. So like what I encourage people to do is just get that movement every single day, even if it's walking, and. I've had friends go like, you know, like, how do you run, you know, an hour a day every day or something, right? Um, Like, I I feel like crap if I don't run the whole hour. Well, like, I want people, like, I encourage people to, like, just be proud that you're moving every day and you're staying consistent in your battle in the pain cave, uh, whatever that is. So, if some days, even for me, like, my pain cave is walking five miles like I'm just miserable all every single mile but I'll at least walk the miles when I'm not feeling my best so it doesn't always have to be running Um, it can be walking can be hiking I just I just encourage you to get some good time on your feet get out there stay active and yes today may suck this run might suck but make sure you finish those those last six minutes if this is an hour workout even if you have to walk it and tomorrow, who knows, you might come back with some, some food in the belly and a new mindset, and you might crush that next 60 minutes. And you'll be proud that you finished 60 minutes two days in a row rather than calling it quit. So my, my thing is just keep going. Even if it's small steps, take the steps forward and just keep consistently building on that. And we all have bad days. We all have good days. Some days I'm flying, and some days I'm definitely walking. But the, the moral of the story is I'm always moving. So I just encourage people to just stay consistent on the movement. I think walking is probably the most underrated form of exercise there is. It's such an incredible way to get moving that isn't so hard on your body, right? And it's like, why isn't walking a sport? Why isn't walking something that we, uh, we really appreciate? Because you walk long enough, you know, you start getting to 30 miles, 40 miles. It's difficult to walk another mile, so... Kudos yeah, and you, sometimes that walk too, man, like will just change – like a 20-minute walk could start, again, changing that mindset. And maybe you started negative. Oh, this doesn't feel good. This doesn't feel good. Well, now the mindset, 20 minutes, the body's flowing. Things start feeling good. Then you go like, oh, damn, like I feel pretty good. Maybe I can run this next mile. And then now you've given yourself an opportunity rather than just sitting on the couch and calling it a day. Well, maybe now you just walked one mile and you ran one mile. Better than sitting on the couch. I give so much props to anybody – whether it's walking, running, or hiking, anybody who's getting off that couch every day, because I'm, I see just so many people uh, 
just being very sedentary. So to for us to see it and then still like not fall into that trap, and and obviously we have like so much entertainment at our hands with you know the TV and all that kind of stuff. So I give a lot of respect, a lot of props, a lot of love, support for anybody moving every day. Um, so much props to anybody out there who's just getting off the couch. I love it. Talk to me about someone you've inspired or who has looked at your story and said, okay, I'm, I'm inspired by this per- by you. And is there an example of that that sticks out for you? The two most would be my two siblings, uh, my brother and my sister. Um, you know, I think when I started, uh, they were probably more like, uh, you know, my brother's crazy. Um, <laughs> but I think as I've just kept going, um, I think they've seen me persevere through some tough times as like a lot of times they're like my crew and they're my pacers and they're they're working with me in these events and I think they've seen the community that has been created to where they're they have changed what they believe is their limits and have followed suit in believing that we're limitless and the importance of community um, and have also went into running ultras uh, and ha- having a lot of success as well and inspiring others and inspiring their kids and I definitely see like uh, a proud Ness, um, and a pep in their step for just life that I think they would they would say that I've inspired out of them um, which was definitely one of my initial motivators for doing what I'm doing because again I'm the oldest brother or the oldest sibling so seeing them um, follow suit and had the benefits and the happiness and the beauty um, has really been beautiful for me to see for them and then to see them which this is what makes my heart my heart melt is they're paying it forward by inspiring their kids like my brother's daughter just did an ultra and she's 12 years old you know and we all got behind her and we ran it with her and we just like you know it's just it's just it's like we're figuring out life in my opinion like we're the joy isn't let's all get together and get beers and get hammered in the backyard like i'm cool with having fun sometimes but like the joy is like let's go find a challenge and let's come together and whoever's in front whether that's me whether that's my sister whether that's my 12 year old niece let's band together and let's get through this challenge as a crew as a team as a wolf pack as a family and it's just so fulfilling like it lights me up like it just lights me up in a way that nothing lights me up and I'm seeing it light them up so that would be my my most precious example dude that is your work and the things you've done have had such an incredible impact on not only the people closest to you but the people closest to them and the ripple you've created is something that is such a beautiful thing and how did it how that happen with your 12 year old niece how how'd she decide oh i'm I'm gonna run an ultra tomorrow it's just watching me and her dad my brother just like i've been relentless man i've been like i said i've been hitting ultras every month i've been throwing myself in the dungeon basically and my brother had a, a string where he was setting up some some really tough challenges and so with my niece you know she she started off like let's go 5k and then half marathon and the marathon and then she was like I want to do an ultra so I think I I can't speak specifically to why she did it but my guess would be you know she saw her dad you know her uncle her tia you know all you know finish 
challenges they set for and train for it and work really hard towards it and then finish. So she wanted to experience that herself. So my brother trained her and she was training for it. And, and then we went out and we did it uh, around her neighborhood, you know. So my, my assumption is she just wanted to see and experience what she sees her family doing. We've become so accustomed to what the people around us are doing, especially as young children. And when the people around you are pursuing the highest versions of themselves to such an extreme, it, I'm sure, leaves an impression on them, on children, your own and and your brother and sister's children, that will forever be in their mind. And to just know that to be true is my grandpa, he started running marathons when he was 40, and I think of him as a runner. And I think of him as able to take on any challenge he sets for himself. And I didn't even watch him run. I just know the stories. I see the pictures. Yeah. And it lives on. Even though he has got both knees replaced or one of his knees replaced, it doesn't matter. I know him as a runner. I know him as someone who's capable of tackling any challenge. And I didn't even see him run. So just know that your legacy that you're leaving right now is not just going to impact your children, but your children's children and likely their, their children's children's children. So... It's an incredible thing. Goal, man. I, I see you inspiring. I see you changing the world. I'm so grateful for you. My final question to you is what advice do you have for someone pursuing the highest version of themselves mentally, physically, spiritually, whatever it may be? Keep going. <laughs> I mean, that's all, all, all I can say is keep, keep going. Um, you know, you may have some family not get behind you. You might have some friends not get behind you you might have a lot of lonely miles (laughs) there may be obstacles in the way but I can attest that new people will come along love support encouragement new other wolves uh, I like to use analogy of wolves a lot other wolves will come they'll find you they'll pick you up when you need it and and to just keep going, like, it, 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 there's nothing, like, we're living life when you start pushing your extremes. Like, there's nobody that could tell me that on the couch for those five days I was in the mountains that they were living life the way I was living life. Like, I was in those mountains. I was crossing creeks. I was looking at waterfalls. There was wildlife, like, I was in nature just living it up, you know, and it was hard. It was super hard. Like I told you, I was literally crying out there. My body hurt. Everything hurt. But, man, did I feel alive. Did I feel uncivilized. Did I feel like a freaking animal out there. Hell yeah. And so that, I wish everybody could feel that. So, again, just it gets hard. It gets lonely. Sometimes maybe it gets, you know, super tough, super rough. But, just keep going. I encourage I encourage you. If you need some support, come find me. I'll rock with you. Well, I know what the title of this episode will be. That'll be Keep Going. And yeah. thank you, Hector, for your time and, and just incredible wisdom through the hard-fought battles you've been through. Where can people find more from you? The best place to find me is my IG, hrod619. Uh, and I do have a, wolf, uh, a website called wolfpackendurance.com. But uh, pretty much if you hit me up on Instagram, I'll hit you up back. Awesome, and we'll put those below. Thank you again, Hector, for taking the time. Really appreciate it. I appreciate it, brother. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed that episode with Hector Rodriguez. If you enjoyed this episode, it would mean the absolute world to me if you took three seconds out, you pressed the share button on the Spotify, Apple, Google, wherever you're listening, Share that episode and this episode with a friend you think could use this message right now. That would mean the world to me. As always, though, just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for making it into this point of the episode, one hour, nine minutes. I appreciate your time tremendously, and I'm so grateful for it. Thank you for listening, and I will see you in the next episode. Peace.